Hello, hello, hello everyone, this is Dasha Jameson and we're going live today with an amazing artist, Martin Campus. Let me show you several works of his. Hello. Hi, Olga, how are you? Hello, Rina. Thank you for joining us today. And just a reminder, we're doing a series of these interviews to promote our upcoming show uh, for Red Rock Pastel Society of Nevada and Traded Line is May Heath. You still have time to join us and you have time to submit your beautiful pastel paintings for the chance to win $1,000 as a best in show and other amazing prizes from our sponsors. So we're waiting for Martin to join us. Hello, Nettie, how are you? Hi, Anne, you made it, yay. So I'm waiting for Martin to join. How's everyone doing? Hello. Waiting for Martin to join us. Let me show you more paintings. And as a reminder, we have two wonderful giveaways going on. One here on Instagram. So just find the beautiful uh, picture with uh, Terra Je Pastels and you will know everything about how to enter that and another one on Facebook. Okay, Martin is here. Waiting for connection. Hello, oh, Martin. Hi, welcome. Hi. hi. <laughs> welcome to Philadelphia. Thank you. In my little studio here in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Germantown, Philadelphia. Germantown, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah, it's a section of Philadelphia. Yeah, you tag, you tag your pictures usually Germantown, so. Yeah. It's, there's Is a it... lot of these little, it's a very old city. Philadelphia, so they have all these towns that are sections of the city that are named after industries they used to use. They have Flower Town, uh, they have uh, all these towns. You know, Germantown was where a lot of early uh, Germanic families uh, settled in like the 19th, 15th, no, the 18th, 19th century. So oh. on my street, uh, George Washington and his troops used to walk, go through back in the, uh, the, the Revolutionary War. There's areas as you go up the road where there were uh, revolutionary battles. So it's a pretty historic city. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's uh, uh, more history there in Philadelphia than in the most cities of the U.S. It's if a very old, yeah, very old town. <laughs> At one point, it was the capital of the United States. Wow. At one point. Uh, and then New York is, is like a 20-minute uh, well, an hour train ride or a yeah. couple of hour car rides that I get access to great museums. And, and uh, that's it, one of the reasons why I moved to Philadelphia from where I was because of museums. You know, yes. I had to have that access to great museums. Yes, so. absolutely. And yesterday you did a wonderful live from one of the museums. Uh, uh, the Barnes Foundation. Barnes Foundation. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a museum that is a long story, but it's a very unique museum in the fact that it was a collection of post-impressionist uh, work uh, okay. that a uh, very rich 
uh, man, Albert Barnes. He was into pharmaceuticals, but he invested his money in art. And he, Smart man. Yes, and he collected <laughs> this post-impressionist work. When these artists were starving, you know, like, uh, you know, like Gauguin and Degas and uh, Soutine, he was very important for them because he collected their work, so they were able to eat. And what happened, though, that he collected all these pieces, which were very unique for their time period, that it's the only place in the world that you're going to see this collection of this time period. So it's very coveted. You know, the Louvre would love to have the pieces that are in this museum. But it just happened to be this collection. This guy had the forethought to, to collect this specific era. And it's a it's a gem when you go to the when you go to the Barnes Foundation it's beautiful it's, a, it's it's really idiosyncratic because the pieces are not hung in a very uh, uh, what would you call linear fashion so he'll yeah. have a painting he'll have a Degas painting a, a little Degas pastel yeah next to a doorknob that he collected in like Texas okay you know? so it's like yeah, you're that's walking cool. in. Yeah, like you're really walking cool. in somebody's house, right? And, exactly, uh, and exactly. I visited and so the museum like that in London, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so it's, it's very somebody. quirky and, and strange. It, it is. It's like you're walking into somebody's house. But this show uh, that's currently there is on de Kooning and Soutine, which are two uh, artists, particularly de Kooning, that uh, was very important for me uh, as a... Um, as a student, um, on other on on many levels, uh, in terms of pushing paint and like how paint acts as like an, a, a thing alive within itself, um, and but we're not talking about de Kooning, we're talking about yeah, we're talking about you, <laughs> you, Martin. Yes, and there are so many people joining us and let me introduce myself. I'm Dasha Jamison with Red Rock Pastel Society of Nevada and we're doing a series of interviews to promote our upcoming show uh, of pastel work and there were so many people who wanted me to invite you to interview and I thought I don't have a chance but thank you for agreeing. Uh, oh, thank you for having me and thanks to those people for requesting me. Yes, yeah, so Vika and, and everybody else who said, um, Martin, need to be on your show, but this is for you. Martin, tell me, uh, how did you start drawing? Like, it, Long bit? time ago. Well, I wanted to play an instrument. I actually wanted to drive uh, trucks when I was a child, and there was a, I couldn't drive them because I was too young, so I had a teacher that gave me a pencil and said that if I drew it, it'll make me feel like I was driving it. And that was like my first recollection of picking up a pencil. And, uh, you know, it was, that was, you know, I didn't, wasn't conscious of being an artist until I was, you know, I left high school. Other than that, it was just something that was fun that made yeah. me feel like I wasn't alone and it gave me a sense of identity. I'm one, I'm one of five in my family. So I easily got lost in the shuffle. And so, <laughs> are you, so, are you oldest? Uh, like, no, I'm third. Okay. Middle fourth, child. Fourth, fourth, fourth. Fourth. I have a younger brother. So now I'm not the baby anymore. So he let a lot of the steam out of that. But, yeah, it was very strange because out of the five, I was the only one that paint drew, and I was stra- I was weird because the rest of them were were normal, and I wasn't. Aww. So it was good because they kind of left me alone, and I was able to do what I did, and there was a nice sense of security and kind of being different. Uh, as long as Martin, you know, Martin isn't in the way and he's drawing, it's fine. He's not causing trouble. He's in his room drawing pictures of trucks. As long as he's there, it's okay. You know, he's not burning things down and he's not ripping things apart. And I think they love that. You know, and then so. So that, you didn't use a lot of oil paint and. Uh, <laughs> no, I was drawing a lot. I drew a lot with uh, pencil and then pastel. 
Actually, I was working with Pastel quite early on How the game. How did you get introduced to that medium? Uh, it must have been in high school. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't know. It was maybe I found a box and used it and liked the way it smelled. I don't know. But I don't... Uh, Maybe it's because I'm from the Southwest and it's gritty and it's like dirt and I can identify with the soil. Yeah. Uh, and it's not as messy. You know, you just open up a box and, you know, when you draw, it's just immediate. You just do it. Whereas yeah. oil, you have to like prep it and get your brushes. And there's a little bit of, of separation between you and the immediacy. And I've always been someone who's very immediate to the emotion. And uh, charcoal was the first and that led me into pastel which was just like, you just take a stick and boom, you got a painting, yes. you, know, you don't have to prep it. And it's just, you get the result very quickly, which matched my temperament to want to do things very immediate. And then <clears throat> it's always been that thing that has been like the, uh, the, uh, the drawing has always been the, uh, the foundation for everything. And because of pastel, it's helped me become a painter okay. with oil. So when I'm painting in oil, I'm actually imagining I'm using pastel. So, so one Sorry. video, no, that was very interesting. And uh, pastel is known for being that immediate medium. And uh, that's important, but you recognize it as its own medium and it's yeah. beautiful on its own and also it helps you like your oils are fantastic i show some of your pastels but your oil work is fantastic and it, that's very Thank interesting you. way how you uh think of the medium what you when you paint the oil you imagining mm -hmm. the pastel stick yeah so you Cause pre I've, yeah because i've pasteled more than i've ever done it was my gateway drug into oil paint and i feel <laughs> at home when i I pastel so the grand majority of the work that I do is still in pastel you know I can think easier with it it's much more uh, uh, to use that word over and over again immediate you know I get an idea boom I can do it I'm, it feels good it just feels like of the earth very organic very primal very visceral like skin you know and, and I like that uh, but what who really hit it home for me pastel wise was Degas and everybody, yes. like every pastelist, if they don't say Degas is wasn't an influence, you got to go get your head checked. There's something wrong with you. Because Degas <laughs> is like the, he still is. He's like the the premier star, always. And I've, when I saw what he did with pastel, I think that was the moment where I thought, you know, it's a medium into itself. It could stand on its own. Because yes. he did it. He made pastel more than just a parlor trick it was a thing yes exactly know? that's uh what the guy did for pastel i guess he uh he's the one who inspired sennelier according to pierre uh to make pastel in yeah. that range of color so yeah, really. we, we all owe the guy a big thank you for so much <laughs> yes yeah I, I visited the sennelier store in paris that he used to go to which was quite a amazing and then i visited his grave in uh montparnasse when i was there i wrote a little note on his gravestone to thank him and i put it on the door and it slipped down i think it went into his crypt so <laughs> i was like one of my things i had to do go to paris and go visit big al's grave and, th and thank him for being there for me you know so big 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 uh, shout out to uh Yes. Every time I go to Moscow, I got to go to the Pushkin Museum of Art and sit mm -hmm. across his blue dancers. That's one oh. of my favorite paintings. And there is nothing like uh, seeing pastel in person. Like know, with, right? with, with everything right now being mostly online, so as our pastel show is online this year, but we're working on some live shows later in, in a year in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you got to go to the museum like you did yesterday, you, you got to see pastel, you can see like it in person. That's wonderful. And yeah, it's, it's a little 
emotional because you're in the same space that that artist was. You know, there's the painting, but then you're standing where de Kooning must have stood. And you're seeing it. Uh, and this, there's nothing that will ever compare to going to a museum, you know, with COVID being the way it is and people not being able to go to museums. Now things are beginning to open up a little bit here in America. It's like you got to get back to the experience of being in front of one of those things because they do more than a book, uh, than anything. And, you know, it's like, it's still my lifeblood to be in the proximity of a good collection, just to know that I can drive 20 minutes into the city from where I'm at and see, you know, there we have three beautiful Degas here. You know, that I visit all the time. I don't visit all the time, but I, I go to them when I need to. You know, when I need to see when, my day guy, I go see them. That's and, awesome. Uh, but they're, it's like I have to have them. They're more than paintings and drawings. They're like members of my family that I have to see. Martin, you know? I will read uh, several comments. So here's hello from Italy. And uh, that's beautiful, Martin. I agree with every word. Uh, somebody have to leave and for yeah. those who are watching us live big shout out and if you're going to watch recording we're going to save it on our red rock account so you can watch it later on instagram tv and if martin permit we will put it on youtube so more people can totally. see us totally chatting. yeah and please here, do whatever you can oh thank you and here is Anne uh from uh She's saying what she purchased one of your painting in a figure class a couple of years ago, and oh, she has man. it in her collection. So she Aww. she has a more personal, intimate experience with your paintings oh, at your own you house. So, much. <laughs> so, so thank you so So a lot of hearts going and uh, keep feeding that painting food. Give him some water. Give it some air. <laughs> mm. And uh, how oh. my friends say, uh, collect art from the living artists because yeah, that's how beautiful <laughs> <laughs> yeah we need the help you know it's good it helps the artist uh, you know it helps them kind of helps them with the food and get more paint but it also helps them kind of believe in their image their, their vision when you when you patronize and help especially the young artists students that are barely making it you know, give them uh, you know, purchase work from living artists, especially those students, they really need it. Especially more now than ever, I think, because of uh, the way the world is, COVID, and them not being able to get into school and classes and they do everything virtually. It's good to kind of, you know, help them out. I was there. We were all there when we were young and needed help and we didn't know what we were going to do. And, you know, you're st sitting in a room in front of a bare piece of paper and you don't know to pour your guts out in it and it's very hard to do that sometimes some days it's easy but it's mostly hard to kind of face who you are and put something down and, and be truthful about it so and i know kids are like that i know where they're at when they're starting out as artists and they're not sure if this choice they're making to be a creative person is an economical one or a sane one you know and I'm there to tell them, do it. It's worth it. You know, it's going to be hard, but if you stick with it, it's going to give you so many rewards. You know, I'm from a very small town in the Southwest. There's no reason why I should be here. You know, it, it was my belief in a vision and the figure that brought me to where I'm at. All those models I've worked at, worked with, who've given me inspiration push my pastels i would not be here without them um they made me uh i did some of the work <laughs> but uh you never forget the people that helped you yeah. to who you are we're all products of other people's help so uh, uh so yeah there are some more great comments coming in uh great uh, greetings from germany Martin is a very nice person and an amazing artist. I cannot agree more. Uh, Victoria is say, saying Martin is a generous teacher. I love, I love his course of figure drawing with pastels. You're going to come back to that because you have something uh, 
in works right now, right? And yeah. artists help connect us to divine, and your work is amazing. Uh, um, oh, oh, this is nice. I like this. <laughs> I know. Good. Like, yeah. <laughs> good to have this. Yes. Um, so, uh, tell me about your teaching experience, please. Um, well, uh, I've. I'll try to be brief, even though I've been like. Oh, we, oh, oh, oh. we have we have time, so. Uh, okay, so. It, you're talking been, very nicely, so I like listening I, good, to you. Good, 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 good. So my teaching experience is uh, happened very quickly. Uh, it's actually really, really started in 2014. Prior to that, I was kind of doing little things. Uh, I I didn't realize. I wanted to teach until I actually had to do it. I had uh, someone uh, needed someone to fill in, and I did it, and I enjoyed it. And then I just took it from there. I remember the first day I taught, I said, "How am I gonna? I don't. I'm a fraud. No one. They're not gonna believe me. I'm a failure." Uh, and then I had to get up and and do it in front of like 15 people and I did it. I nailed it. I was like, this was so much fun. I want to do more. And so I began to slowly kind of build that and um, the confidence. It was, I think the big thing I learned about teaching is that the students teach you. And I, whenever I do teach, I never go with a lesson plan. I don't have notes about what I'm going to tell them. I let them tell me. I learn by their questions. And uh, that's what's important. People take your class because they're trying to solve something. They see something inherently in your work that they feel they can help them gain traction in their own work. And so I'm very keen on that. So I like to listen to them and then hear their questions. And then I come back. So I don't dictate, you know, what I do. I, I I ended up having the honor of being a professor of, of, of drawing at the, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts for a couple of years. And because um, I graduated from that school here in Philadelphia, the, Pen the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, great school, wow. still wow. is. Some of the greatest American artists studied there, from Thomas Aikens to Mary Cassatt, uh, one of America's first art schools. Uh, and I studied under some amazing professors who I patterned my method of teaching on. Um, and so that was a huge effect. And they gave me a lot of, tr of fuel to become who I am as an instructor. And so I've I, I taught there. For, it was like the biggest honor. One of the biggest honors of my life was to have been an instructor there for a couple of years. And then I began to teach internationally. I've taught in South Africa, Ireland, New Zealand, uh, the south of France, Spain. Um, so I've, in a very short period of time, I've done a lot. Whirlwind. That's and amazing. I've only got... I've only gotten better, and I really attribute that to the students. They've made me a better teacher. This is very generous of you, and one of the comments confirming that, too. Great man and a teacher. I love your course in Madrid. Yeah. Hello oh. from Morocco here. Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you for so teaching. Us. Yes, teaching is so much fun because I love hearing people's struggles because I was there. I had the same issues about the figure, about how to manipulate pastel, how to translate an idea into a concrete image. It's not easy. And so I love to be there hearing uh, how people feel when they have an idea, but they can't get down. You know, how to navigate that thought into action and into a concrete image is quite compelling, very exciting, sometimes can be even more exciting uh, discussing it than actually doing it. So I hope to keep doing more of it, and I hope once all this COVID stuff is over, we can all 
get into the physical classes again and do it. I've totally embraced the whole Zoom thing yeah. uh, and been teaching a lot through through uh, uh, these uh, vir virtual platforms. Um, and I'm learning just about as much through them as I would physically, but I do miss being in person with people. Of course. Uh, that will never, nothing will ever change that. But, uh, but yeah, that's my teaching. Uh, that's uh, very small on that. Uh, Kathy saying, I'm about to teach my first class, so I appreciate your words of encouragement. Yes, that was beautiful, how you feel and how you overcame that. So I think it will help a lot of uh, artists who are about, about to become teachers everybody yeah. everybody feels that and you just need to do that and yeah just just be yourself you know when i'm teaching i always imagine myself what would i do with that drawing it's about me first i'm, I'm imagine it like when some student comes up with me with a painting and tell me what do you think i should do i literally imagine it's mine and i usually would answer by talking to my talking to them as me in the third person, I'd say, well, you know, Martin would actually redraw that and go back to the gesture, you know, and destroy it, get rid of it to find out why you, what compelled you in the beginning and then move from there. So I, I tend to do that. You know, I put myself in their place because they have the same issues that either I have now or I have in, in the past. So for those of you who are teaching, do it. Even if you feel like you can't do it, do it. It's probably one of the most rewarding things an artist can do is to pass on uh, their knowledge. Someone asked, where do I teach? Um, I teach through the Washington Studio School uh, here in Washington, D.C. I also teach at the Winslow Art Center uh, here at the Fleischer Art Memorial in Philadelphia. And I also teach uh, uh, privately, I actually do these online Zoom classes. Uh, and, I do one one or two a month. And there is uh, one class coming up, what you have yes. in your bio. Can you tell more about this class, please? Yeah, it's more of a painting class, oil painting class. I've done at least three pastel workshops the past, past months. But this one is in May, and it's from... Uh, it's on the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th. It's in my uh, bio if you all are interested. Um, and it's uh, a three-day workshop each Tuesday from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and it's just really how I, manip how I build a composition and think of paint as if it's skin. You know, and I do talk a bit about pastel and how I've used that as a way of understanding paint. Because again, like I said in the beginning, when I'm painting in oil, I'm imagining how I would do it in pastel. So it always goes back to drawing. And I'm just mad about drawing. Still will. Still am. So, yeah. This is beautiful. And, uh, yeah, more comments coming in, and Art Gar saying, Martin, I want to be your student one day. And uh, Oh, you will. You will. You will. At some point. Let me ask you about uh, 2020, sure. and how did you do live drawings uh, like uh, during that time? Did you embrace Zoom, or you still had models? Like uh, Because models needed help during that time. I hear that a lot from the... Uh, artists oh you're talking about during the pandemic how yeah. i had to adapt from how i would work because yeah i was working with models frequently in my studio uh in the live so if you can look here i have my model riser boom, boom, boom. where my models come and pose there's a chair um and i'm actually beginning to have models come back in to the studio just one model that i know is is okay um but during the uh, the whole when the pandemic happened and everything was shutting down, I had to uh, adapt to uh, virtual posing, uh, which I was a bit apprehensive in the beginning because I'm very much a traditionalist in terms of working with the model. Yeah. Um, 
And so I kind of went into it hesitantly. And I had to because all the workshops that I had fell through. They all canceled. So I had to make money. I had to eat. And so I began to learn the Zoom platform. And then I thought, okay, I'll do the modeling on the Zoom. It's not going to be the same because they're just flat on my screen. And I loved it. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I got hooked on it. I started getting models as much as I started spending more, a little bit more money than I should have <laughs> finding models because they began, the models also had to learn the platform. Yes, absolutely. And, and do you guide them to how to light the space so it would be less flat? Because we all want to look good on camera. So uh, did you uh, direct the lighting in a model? You let oh, them do that. I let them do it. I'm, I'm pretty laid back. I'm very pragmatic. I don't, I'm not picky about, I actually kind of like the very basic uh, situation that some models, you know, like sometimes they're modeling in their kitchen, you know, and I yeah. kind of like the, the, the kind of like the primitive. It makes it raw. They, it makes it raw. Yeah. It, make it, well, it makes it real. It makes yeah. it very real. And I really embrace that. But I think, what really prepared me for the whole Zoom um, experience with working models was the fact that I had drawn the models. I had been drawing the model in real life for so long yes. that once I began to work with the models on Zoom, I was surprised that I was imagining them in my studio. Yeah, that's you only know. experience can give it yeah. to you. And for some of you all who are listening who are starting the figure um, and have just started by using Zoom and haven't worked with them all in real life, I would absolutely encourage, I would almost demand that you get models in real life. Uh, try not to get caught up in, in, in learning the figure through Zoom or through uh, a flat image. It's very important that you are in the presence of models so you can feel the depth yeah. and roundness and then work from Zoom. It will be much more enriching. Because um, I'm finding that's the case. There's a lot of young people that are that have begun to kind of work more with the figure, and it's begun to happen since 2020. And part of my fear is that they're not getting the other thing that we've all gotten and they're only learning from like a zoom platform and and you can do good work but you're missing something there's something about depth and the feeling and actually being in the presence with another model it is absolutely important that adds that extra little bit of something to your work that that uh translate something deeper you know um if that makes any sense oh, oh it absolutely does and thank you for encouraging everyone to keep using all the outlets what available right now but don't forget about uh beauty from working from life i think it goes uh, to landscape painting too i mean you can take million photographs but there is nothing but like when you stand with your feet in the soil and you oh yeah or you're to... painting and the dog starts chasing and you gotta run you know <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> and that's happened to me before because i also do landscape painting and there are many stories when i'm out painting and it starts raining or it gets yes. cold or you know and you, can you go feel, out like you can feel it in your painting too like oh what, yeah what did it's... you feel you can smell the soul from the ocean like if it's done right like if you convey yeah. your emotion it's all those peripheral things that make the work, you know, when, when I have a model that comes into my studio, I get nervous, you know, I, my hands start sweating, I start shaking. I'm, I've been drawing the figure for almost 20, 30 years, and I still feel that way. And I'm, I get that way when I have a physical model that comes into my studio. And that's an important thing for me to feel, this kind of, you know, they're nude and I'm wearing clothes and there's something weird about that. <laughs> it's like not right. So it's kind of irregular. Oh, I, you know, I just, it's like 
just remember the joke. It's so bad, but uh, what do you think about nude painting? I'm okay with it. Okay, when I'll be nude, it's from the <laughs> artist, so <laughs> like when the, that could be opposite situation. I just like to draw right. nude. <laughs> Right, right. It's it's odd. And sometimes <laughs> when I'm working with the model, I there's moments when I'm working where I step outside of the seriousness of what I'm doing. And I look at myself and like, you're 49 years old and you're weird drawing nude people. That is just an odd thing. And it's good to do that. It's good to get out of yourself and see yeah. how ridiculous it is. But it's so wonderful to be ridiculous. It's so important to have hope in a vision. Uh, it's so brave to develop your own world and to learn how to believe it, you know, how to believe in yourself. Uh, because once you do, the world comes in and becomes part of your world. Uh, and there's something quite magic about that, you know, I, Magic does exist out there, people. <laughs> it's there in your studio, hidden in your charcoal and pastel and your paper. You just have to be there and coax that magic out. It happens. Very much so. Speaking about magic and uh, we all magicians, we trying to convey 3D work on a 2D surface. Let me ask you what all the pastel artists are wondering. So if you have to go to the deserted island and you can take just two pastel brands with you, which ones that would be? And what paper or what surface will you take? Okay, you? That's, a, that's a good I like that. That's a fun question. I would take a set of Sennelier's and uh, Hanamule, Hanamule on charcoal and pastel paper and some nitrum charcoal. Those would be the things that, that would be in my deserted island. Thank so, yeah. you. <laughs> Hanamu velour paper or which Oh, uh, no, just regular pastel yeah. and charcoal. Pastel and charcoal. I don't yeah. have to look that paper up because yeah. I, I came across their velour paper, not my thing, but this one will be interesting to check out. Yeah, the, the Hanamu pastel is a white paper. It's very kind of, I'm, I don't use the uh, sandpaper because it's just too beautiful to use. It's too, it eats your pastels up. I love it, but it just, yeah. it's, it's too good. So mm -hmm. the, the Hanamule regular white pastel paper is wonderful to work with. And then the Hanamule charcoal paper is, uh, if both of those companies were to go out of existence and stop, I'd be very sad. And of course, I'd find another paper, but but you like these ones? Yeah, I love them. They do what I need to do. Uh, they feel good. I. Uh, it happens to be the paper that I've both those types of Hanamule are the two papers that I've been using consistently because they give me what I need to give them. Uh, and the Sennelier goes without saying why you would want that. It's the best. I just uh, had the chance to talk to Pierre, who brought Sennelier to US, uh, and uh, he was talking about that the guy and stuff. So we're hoping to get him on our show too, so he can say in depth all the stories what go into making those beautiful pastels. Yeah, yeah. There's so many great pastel companies. There's Diane Townsend. There's Unison. Uh, there's too many of them. Uh, that are so wonderful. Uh, but Sennelier is the cream of the crop. It's like, I always feel good when I, when I use that brand of pastel. And it really isn't because Degas used it, and it's because it's I love it. Okay. When I was younger, I always wanted a set of a Sennelier's, and I finally was able to get some one day when I was, and I was like, oh, yep, yeah, that's, that's the pastel. So. But yeah, where are your, where, oh, do you like Nicolay's, Nicolay, Nicolay's technique of, of, of gesturing? Oh yeah, I love his technique of the constant gesture and the movement. 
So, yep. You earlier on talked about your inspiration, uh, how the Kooning and the guy inspired you. Whom can you name uh, from the classics and contemporary artists who inspire you? Well, you know, Degas, classic, uh, you know, De Kooning, uh, Egon Schiele. Let's see. Uh, contemporary people. I love uh, a guy by the name of Nick Bale. He's on Instagram. Chris Liberti. Uh, let's see. Who else? Uh, uh, there's uh, Stanka Kordic. There's, uh, there's so many. I could just keep going. That, that, that really inspire me out there. Uh, but, uh, contemporary, like well known, the people know, not too many of them. Uh, but I'm trying to think now. That's a good question. I think I named them. You know, Chris Liberty and. No. no, I mean living artists, not uh, yeah, what they yeah, call in a museum contemporary. Yeah, he's alive. There's Chris, and then there's uh, uh, Nick Bale, and then there's uh, uh, Stanka Kordic. They're, they're all great. They're the ones that I can begin to think of that when I'm opening up Instagram, I look at their work, and I'm like, ah, they get me angry because I want to do the beautiful work they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> they inspire, you know. Gay Jupton Brow, Casey Moran. These are people that are, are, are fantastic, that I love looking at their work and they give me ideas to kind of do things. You know, it's good when you have someone that's doing something that you're doing and they're doing it much better. You so know, it's a good like, thing, yes. right? Uh, yes, it's like, ah. <laughs> you're answering it... my internal questions. I am not saying them, but you're kind of channeling it. <laughs> because I just yeah. had a conversation about that. Oh, my mm -hmm. friends are much better artists than I am. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm just... currently inspired. Yeah, angry, just... but inspired. Yeah, you get angry, like, damn it. They're doing, <laughs> yes, I know. They're doing what I wanted to do. You yes. know, I was thinking of doing it, and they already did it. Damn it. <laughs> And then you, because I'm a product of figure drawing groups. When I first started drawing the figure back in, like really drawing the figure back in the 80s, you know, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I would go to figure drawing groups very, very, very exhaustively. I would go to like three or four a week, every yeah. week for like years, just, just trying to build my strengths of the figure. And I was... Many a time I'd go to these groups, there were people that were five times better with me, better than me in terms of building form and color, and you know, and I learned early on that you put your easel next to them, and you look over their shoulder. Oh my gosh, it's you, so tiny. <laughs> and you steal uh, from them. You, those are your friends, and they build you, and yes. it comes back to what I was saying, that I would not be here without all those people that inspired me, uh, who were f much better with me, tech better than me technically, that had the grace to help me. You know, and one of the most important things that you all can do as artists is to pass on what you have and help other artists. You know, there's nothing worse than seeing an artist who is trying to get something that you already know and you walk by and don't give them help. That's a crime. Yeah. Your job is you, to yes. give. And not, <laughs> hey, not for money. You know, money's good, but don't, you just go because. No, you need to eat too, but uh, share it's an, from generosity and uh, you feel like best, talent is obligation to share. Yes, yes. The best thing that an artist can do in their life is to perform public service. You help. For the grace of those people go I, you know, so. Martin, thank that. you so much. And here is another comment. Hi, Martin, Michelle W from uh, Cape Town workshop. So you performing oh, yeah. your public service very well. So yeah. we have people. <laughs> I would uh, love to go back. I want to so go back to South Africa. I loved it. It was, it was, it was a stressful time when I went to that workshop because at the same time I had a solo show in Paris, oh. and I, ha I was teaching that workshop at the same time that I was trying to release the work from customs. Oh, yeah. That's so it was, 
it was stressful because I was teaching these wonderful students, and at the same time, I was on my smartphone talking to people in Paris, trying to tell them, you know, they need to release them because my solo show was like in a week and I had to have them release it so I could have the show. So it was really tough for me. Uh, I loved that workshop, but I had it was so tense that I actually developed this pain in my arm from, uh, from just being so uh, uh, tense. You know, when you get, when you develop like um, a tenseness, it manifests itself. You know, yeah, you in your like body. A, so you your do body. In, that mind-body connection. So yeah, totally. Then, you know, I wanted, I love these students in South Africa. It was, you know, and I was in a very exotic part of the world and, you know, on the other side of the planet and they believed in me and I had to deliver the goods and do it with the passion that I have. So it took a lot out of me and it was such a great experience. I hope to get back. I want to go back so bad to uh, Cape Town. They treated me so well. Some of the most beautiful people on the planet are there. Michelle is saying what a fabulous teacher you were and she remember your solo show issues and she was blown mm -hmm. away by the way you use color so intuitively. Yeah. So. yeah, I don't know anything about color, quite honestly. I, I've never completed a color chart in my life, which some people would think would sound pompous. You know, they see my color, you know, but I, I'm dumb with color. I am like a child with color. I, when color works for me, it's because the subject has inspired me. So you know, you're like this, uh, Matisse child approach to the color. Like, yeah. why did you draw people blue? Because blue is my favorite color. Yeah, <laughs> it's very much like that. Uh, I key in on the model and I key in on the emotion and that presents the color. So I don't have a formula. I just go by, I really follow what the, uh, my inspiration gives me. It's very important that uh, who I paint, what I paint is not an object, but a living entity, you know. Don't ever treat your models like they're objects. They're human loving beings, you know. So. Do, you, do you believe in talent or you believe in a hard work? It's in a question. I, th less. I think both. Okay. I think both. I think both. I, don't, I wouldn't say that there's no such thing as talent. There is, you know, but talent can be defined many ways. You can be talented in being uh, a good person. You can be talented in, that, in, in, in being a hard worker, you know. So it's a mixture of both. So, yeah. There are many hearts going your way. Yeah. Long Lucky. comment right there uh, about... Uh, there are some people connecting to each other on our chat from Morocco. So uh, yeah, I'm seeing people. Again. Yeah, I'm seeing people say how we're lucky in my country because in their countries, being an artist is not appreciated, or working with models you can't do it. And I completely. That's another thing that really enforces the importance of what I do is that there are young artists that I've encountered who don't have the freedoms that we have in America. I remember when I was in South Africa, the students there, how wonderful they were because they didn't have the kind of materials that we have in America. Yeah. And it made me come back to my country uh, being more appreciative of who and what, you know, what I do. And for those people in other countries, I hear you. You know, whether you're in, you know, the people in Iran and people in Afghanistan, you know, there are so many artists out there that just love drawing the figure who can't. And I could just see them hiding under their covers with the phone trying to draw a figure because they can't do it. You know, th their countries don't allow them to do that. And I'm with you there. I tell you, keep going. Don't stop. If you have to hide it, it's worth it. You know, being an artist is worth risking 
risking things. You know, you put 100% into it. So for those of you who are sneaking it and having to do it because people won't let you, don't ever stop. Keep doing it because the times will change where you will be able to be free with it. And those moments where you had to struggle will mean so much. They build you. You know, so don't ever stop. For those of you in other countries, you know, do it. It's worth it. Okay? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here to tell you that. You can do it. Somebody has to tell that. So, uh, hello from Afghanistan. Yeah. I've, there's at least two or three people that I, uh, talk to privately on Instagram, I message who are from these countries that, that tell me these stories that in my country, Martin, we're not able to work with the model like you can. And I, it must be wonderful to do what you do. And it, it, I, sometimes I have to just put my phone down and just like put my head in my hands and like, God, these are such brave people, you know, to, to want to do it. And it, it comes back to why I have to keep doing it. I have to set that example for them that what they're doing is not futile, that what, what their love of the figure is a universal love of the form and the human body and the expressiveness, you know, and they probably have it even deeper than we have it here in our country. And so you all in those very repressed uh, countries, you are such an inspiration. So you yeah, again back to uh, the theme what your students inspire you even more and the people whom you are able to connect with via Instagram via your platform you have a loud voice and you promoting the beauty of uh, human body form and for art yeah. and thank you for encouraging everyone yeah. to do so yeah the figure is a beautiful creation that we should never feel ashamed of whether it's clothed or unclothed, sensual or non-sensual, it is who we are. And to shame the body is, is, is a bad, is a horrible thing. You know, and it's, we celebrate who we are as human beings through our drawings and paintings from thin to large to skinny to whatever. We are all one, you know, so it's a good talk. It's kind of making me feel a little heavy in the heart, you know. Oh. <laughs> it brings it all back. You know, I'm looking looking at all my paintings and thinking that like it's worth it. Can you show yeah. us around? Uh, yeah, your I can a... yeah, yeah, I Yeah, I can. I have a little. I have a swing boom. It's a small studio, so um, yeah, my my space in Philadelphia. Actually, let me just take the camera off on my iPad. So uh, this is my studio. I have a beautiful skylight here. But these actually had a gallery come in. Uh, these are paintings that I have stacked against my wall. I'm planning on having a um, show later on my oil paintings. These are my one of my abstract pastels that I'm doing. And then my setup for doing my work is here. Can you all see that? Yes, and uh, right now there are comments, guys, but if you go back and uh, watch it on Instagram TV, there will be no comments and you will be able to see Martin's screen. So Yeah, so, yeah this is my space. There's Philadelphia. A little bit of home there. This is where the models that I work with pose. And my painting board, this is where I hang my paintings to work on. But it's a small space. It's really nice. And this is where I do the, the main bit of my work. There. I was teaching a class before this discussion, so it was a quick little sketch. I was working with the model online. So... You know, my pastels are here. Actually, a very non-linear way that I have my pastels. I, I'm not neat. 
so I don't have all my reds and my pinks and my blues and my spots. I have it all like a jumble of a mess. I actually can understand my pastels when they're just a, a mess like that. If I have uh, my setup all relegated into neat little boxes, it's, it won't work. It, it, I can't do it because it's just like too neat. And I can't think if everything's neat. It has to be all random because then I make random choices that work for me. I totally can so. relate. And mm -hmm. we talked to another wonderful artist, uh, Albert Handel. He has his palette also organized in chaotic way, but he find perfect value, perfect color every time. So you wouldn't doubt his organization skills when yeah. looking at his painting and whatever works for everyone. So. Yeah, I, I admire people that can have those wonderful setups and put the pastel back in that color. I just don't have that frame of mind to do it. And I love working with distraction. I like kind of having, again, a very idiosyncratic messy way of working uh, I feel that when it's a mess around me what I'm putting on the paper is more organized so it's like an organize an organization of the mess around me beautiful. <laughs> Cre creative beautiful mess yeah for sure Yashika Agura saying it's comfortable space where the brushes and pictures are well organized so our viewers notice what your part of your studio is organized yeah it's 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 actually quite messy right now you know i'm much more my my studio doesn't have this much work in it uh i tend to have a very sparse space you know i don't have like to have a lot of my work hanging i just have these because a gallery came in to look at my work for a, a current show coming up later on this year is it so going to be a philadelphia show Mm -hmm. It's going to be a local gallery here in Philadelphia. Uh, but most of this work is usually in, a, in a, my storage space. I have a separate st art storage space that's just filled with artwork. Uh, so these are all from the dungeon. They're going back in the dungeon next oh. week. <laughs> dungeon and dragon. <laughs> yeah, I can't have my work, old work in front of me because yeah. then I'll want to go work on it. And then I'll destroy it. So... I really got to get these babies back in their uh, other space or I'm going to want to, because I just want to work on things. I'll see something I did two months ago and I'm like, you know, I need to put another face on that and I have to stop. I can't do it. So yeah. you're rescuing your paintings from yourself. I am. I'm actually looking at one that's going to go in the show that I'm gonna, I want to put a face in, but they've already taken a picture of it and want to put it on the wall and I can't do that you know so <laughs> yeah don't do that <laughs> i have to I have to kind of keep them away so. that's wonderful i hope you uh, we can talk more with you and maybe you will agree to do figure demo for our red rock pastel society of nevada we do those zoom meetings and people from totally all i will i will send you more messages and we kind of uh, leaning to the end of our discussion. We can talk more for hours. Uh, but, oh, yeah. uh, let's, let's keep our viewers hungry. And thank yeah, you, yeah. everyone, for tuning in. Uh, check out Martin's bio for upcoming oil painting class. And stay tuned yes. for Red Rock announcements. We're going to yeah. have our show with entry deadline of May 5th. Nude figure drawing. Everything is welcome. Need to be your original work from your setup and uh, hope you will enter martin maybe you will enter so we have some maybe. Wonder, uh, we have some maybe. we would love to see you among our members you maybe yeah, you will totally. find interest uh, in oh, our I, show oh i would love to if you can if you I would did. not too disturbed by my strange figurative pieces they're very odd i love the fact that they're kind of weird Strange they, they're absolutely beautiful and uh, <laughs> stunningly amazing. Arizona yeah, pastel artist saying hi and uh, very thankful for introducing um, you to the public. And, I think you don't need introduction, but I'm right. happy to, to share. Yeah, and thank you, uh, the Red Rock people, for having me come on and, and say my little bit. And uh, 
again, everyone visit the uh, the Red Rock. It's the Red Rock Pastel Society, right? Yeah, Red Rock Pastel Society yeah. of Nevada. Uh, but yeah. they had to kind of move online recently, mm-hmm. so we have members from all over the world. And we do some local work in Las Vegas and work with some local galleries and everything. Mm-hmm. But most of our meetings available on Zoom for everyone to join in. So we have... Yes, yeah, so you all, you all visit it. We all visit the Red Rock Society in Nevada. Uh, Nevada Society. Ah, I can't even think. Cause I, kinda, I have to have my lunch. But it was great having you all, and I'm so happy that you all joined in. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure uh, meeting you. Thank you all, guys, for watching. And uh, see you soon. Stay tuned on Red Rock. Um, okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Absolutely you. delightful. Thanks, guys. <laughs>